Good morning. We're uh, still working our way through the Psalms. Uh, so we come to Psalm 64 today. And uh, I'm standing up here telling myself, you can't sing like that in the next service or you won't be able to preach. <laughs> Wear my voice out. You know, just. Whew. There's nothing like hearing a congregation sing. And. Uh, they hear the, the hope rise up in people. Praise the Lord. So I, I just want to say a, a little preference here or, or reference before I get started in the sermon. Uh, so uh, this sermon was planned before we knew that, that uh, we would have a worship candidate here today. So there, there's no angle that I'm coming with this sermon. And, and then there would be some of you goes, why didn't you preach something else? It's just not how I do things. It's where we're at. But I want to say to you, brothers and sisters, what, what is in front of us in Psalm 64 is incredibly relevant in all of our lives. You are likely today to feel conviction. I know that I have been convicted in my preparation. But I pray that it's not just conviction for you, that there is hope, that you find the hope that is in the Lord. So Psalm 64, we'll read it, and then we'll seek to explain it and make application of it. Let's stand together. To the choir master, a Psalm of David. Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues with swords, who aim bitter words like arrows, shooting from ambush at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly and without fear. They hold fast to their evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking, who can see them? They search out injustice, saying, we have accomplished a diligent search. For the inward mind and heart of a man are deep. But God shoots his arrow at them. They are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues, turned against them. All who see them wag their heads. Then all mankind fears. They tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. Let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. Lord, help us now. Help us to make sense of this psalm. Help us for those necessary today, this morning, to uprightly apply this to their lives. And Lord, prepare us for the moment when we will need this to rise up and remind us to apply it in the midst of difficulty. And Lord, convict us where we have allowed ourselves to get caught up in things that you are very specific about. Lead us now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can be seated. Unfortunately, we're about to enter another presidential political season. Fortunately, though, we don't live in a place, at least currently, where political leaders are taken out by rival factions with deadly force. But we do live in a place where opponents are taken down with words. Hardly ever do you hear the merits of a side discussed. All you hear is the opponent attacked. This is indicative of our culture. It has become a part of who we are. I've been in multiple meetings with pastors where in 2020, this was said over and over again. Things happened and were said in our church that I had never heard or seen before. We all, at some point, have experienced the pain of being turned on by people around us who have sought to seek to use our words and their words to take us down. 
lies, half-truths, accusations, premeditated sowing of doubt and discord. When you get there, what do you do? How do you, how do you handle this? Here's the main idea that must drive what I say from this point forward. When evildoers plot and practice injustice, the righteous take refuge and rejoice in God who protects and saves. The psalm begins, hear my voice, O God. Verse two, hide me. This is a lament. The word lament, um, you find in the first verse the word complaint. It's not complaining in a negative sense. It is, it is bringing before God. It's a musing of deep concern. Spurgeon said of this text, it is our duty to note how constantly David turns to prayer. And we shall act wisely if we make prayer to God our first and best trusted resource in every hour of need. And in this instance, when, the, when someone has turned against us. So let's first consider with verses two through six, evildoers and how evildoers plot and practice injustice. He prays, hide me from the secret plots, the schemes that are going on behind the scenes, the schemes of the wicked from the throng of evildoers. The word wicked means someone who does evil intentionally. An evildoer is a person who plots and practices injustice. Now this is crucial. I want everybody to slow down and hear me. What is evil then? Well, if you listen to our culture, really, there are very few things now that are considered evil. Someone who goes and shoots up a school or place of business, it's often said on the news, this is the face of evil. I don't disagree with that. There's talk now of a new access of evil, of world leaders who are coming together in a sinister way. I don't know if that's true or not, but you hear that language. This is, this is for me, this is one of the most important parts of this sermon. So what is evil? Here's what it is. It is the wrong use of words. Do you ever consider that you have used words for evil? I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about me. Hide me from the secret plots of the wicked, from the throng of evildoers who wet their tongues like swords. Let's just stop right there. What does that mean? Who wet their tongue like swords. I want you to imagine I got a sword in this hand and a file in this hand. I started to bring a machete and one of my files to make you see this, but I was afraid I'd scare you, so I didn't. This is a person planning. That's not quite how you say it. Yeah, this is how I'm going to say it. Yes, this is how I'll frame it. And when I get around him, I'm going to say this. And when I'm around her, I'm going to say this. And when I'm around this group of people, here's how my words are going to come out. Yes. They wet their tongue like swords. They aim their bitter words like arrows. These are very specific. These are words they planned. You set me up and I'm gonna say it. I'm gonna I'm gonna let it go and pierce you in the depths of your heart. This is a word picture of deliberate preparation of preparing a lethal sword. It is a person who is preparing to, like a sniper, a word sniper, to shoot from ambush at the blameless. Now hear this, verse four. To shoot 
from ambush at the blameless. So here's what this person knows. They're stretching it. They're stretching this thing. But they've got enough. They've got enough to do what they want done. And suddenly, and without fear, they shoot. Almost weekly, because of my experience now, a young pastor calls me, sometimes more than once a week. I used to be that young pastor calling men who greatly affected my life. Absolutely perplexed as to what they're experiencing and what's going on. This week, it was a pastor talking about his wife who was having a normal conversation with a woman from the church who just wanted to talk to her. And in the midst of conversation, the woman erupts. That's what I was looking for. You finally said it, and we're going to take him down. Do you understand what she's going to do? She's going to take what the pastor's wife said and take the pastor down. Waiting, ready. Now these, these people, these people think they're experts and they think they need to get others to agree. So they hold fast to their evil purpose and they talk of laying snares secretly thinking, nobody's gonna notice what I'm doing here. Nobody's gonna figure this out. We're smooth. We're, we're, we've got this done. They've connived. They've thought of all their contingencies and they're out to do their plan. It says they search out injustice, saying, We have accomplished a diligent search. We found the truth. David just stops right here, and here's what he says For the inward mind and heart of a man are deep. And he's not talking positively here. He's talking about the depth of evil in us. Now you could be going, there's no, there's no evil in me. There's no evil in me. Oh, uh -huh. let's turn to James. Turn to James. Now I want to ask you a question. This is very important. Who was James written to? What group of people? You want to guess? Christians. This is not an op-ed in the newspaper to the community. This is to Christians. This needed to be said. It's recorded in the inerrant, infallible, lasting Word of God for us today. So the tongue, James 3, verse 5, is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. A, the tongue is a fire, the world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Fire uncontrollable fire. Then this question, who can tame the tongue? It sounds like the answer is nobody. It can't be tamed. And then it says, with it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. Is the Bible saying this is just normal? This is how it is. You come here and you bless God and thank him for all he's done, and then you go out in the lobby and rip each other to threads. That's just normal. Is that what the Bible's saying? No, that is not what it is saying. Listen to verse 10. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing, my brothers. 
These things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening, both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives or a grapevine produce fruits? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. Now here's what James is doing right here. He is appealing to what's already been said in Scripture and you've got to put it together. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 34, you brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? Now, how do we know you're evil? How do we know evil? You take a gun and shoot people? No. Here's how you know. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth. That's what gives you away. It's what you say. So what's flowing out of me? Fresh water or spring water? Blessing or cursing? Here's a further question. What do we do, what do, we do when we're on the receiving end of fire? What, what do we do when somebody set a trap for you and they come after you? I'll give you the answer. You don't fight fire with fire. Or I was raised. I don't care where you were raised. I don't care what you were taught. The Bible says that you are not to be that way. You say, well, what you do, preacher, when somebody's trying to take you down, when they're after your life, you've got to stand up for yourself. What does the Bible teach? It teaches that the righteous take refuge and rejoice in God who protects and saves. The righteous are those who rely on God. Hear my voice, O God, and in my complaint, preserve my life from the dread of my enemy. I love this last phrase. It is so honest and so insightful. Preserve my life from dread. Dread. I think of how many hours I have wasted worrying about what somebody might do to me or what somebody's after. Dread. Lord, preserve my life from just the dread. It's acknowledging something. People can and will hurt you. They will. They will. This is this is hard understand it's hard to grasp it's hard to get your get a, get a hold of people are going to hurt you people you love people you trust are going to hurt you what do you do let me remind you how this set up Psalm 64 4 Shooting from ambush at the blameless, shooting at him suddenly without fear. They hold fast to their evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly, thinking, who can see them? Here's what happens. Suddenly, without notice, verse 7. But God shoots his arrow at them, and they are wounded suddenly. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues. Turned against them, all who see them will wag their heads. What's God saying here? He's saying that what they fired ultimately is coming back. The boomerang is going to turn. So let's just, let's, just be, let's just be honest about our own lives here. When we've got involved in the evil, and then suddenly, whoo, Back it comes. This is how God has designed it. You reap what you, every time, you reap what you sow. God shoots his arrow at them. They are brought to ruin with their own tongues turned against them. Ruin. Old Testament story is still celebrated. It's a major holiday, major Jewish holiday today, the Feast of Purim. 
Haman hated Mordecai. And he hated Mordecai so bad, he wanted to take out all the Jewish people. Builds a gallows, sets the trap, and what happens? It turns on Haman, and who hangs there? Haman does. This is God's design, ultimately. And when God's design plays out, all mankind fears they will tell what God has brought about and ponder what he has done. Look at this. All mankind fears. Ultimately, this text is pointing us to something bigger. Mankind fears. It is pointing us to the righteous one who was falsely accused and who was executed. Who people used false pretense to kill the Lord Jesus Christ. But God turned the table on the false accusers in that while on the cross, Christ died in our place, taking the penalty of our sin, and he rose again from the grave. God has brought this about and causes all of us to ponder. And it says in verse 10, let the righteous one rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. Let all the upright in heart exult. Let me just lay out a couple principles here. Here's what the New Testament teaches. Christ suffered injustice. You are going to suffer injustice. Rejoice. So that's just antithetical. That just doesn't make sense. Rejoice. Rejoice in what? Golden Gate wrote, Worship appropriately gives opportunity to express our experience, our laments, and our longings. I've drugged myself to worship before. Maybe that was you today. You're just here to lay it all out. But you cannot stop there. You come and express your fears and your longings before God, but you must also be reminded of what God has done and you must expect that God will do it again. Jeremiah 51.10, the Lord has brought about our vindication. Come, let us declare in Zion the work of the Lord. He has brought about our vindication. That's the story of the scripture. The story of the scripture is the saving work of God that is culminated in Jesus Christ. And in Revelation 5, 9, it says, they sang a new song saying, worthy of you to take the scroll and open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. We were reminded that everything has been reversed that Christ has saved us, that he has purchased us, that he has ransomed us from sin and our evil ways, and we are now his people. We are not his own. We are bought with a price. So we don't just come to honor him together in a worship service like this. We now come to honor him with our lives. So how do you honor God in the midst of dealing with somebody who's trying to take you down? That's the question here. I'll ask it this way. Am I repaying evil with evil or am I taking refuge and rejoicing in God who protects and saves? I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Who was 1 Peter written to? Christians. Now watch, here we go again. Finally, this is verse 8, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay what? Evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless. For to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from what? Evil. 
and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. He's writing here to professing believers about evil, the evil use of the tongue, reviling. So I just want to ask a couple questions. Where is the biblical action of honest confrontation and gracious forgiveness? What's happened to it? I just want you to know this, if you you may or may not know this, that Peter, who wrote this epistle, earlier as the church was being founded, Paul had to confront him face to face because he was wrong. Wrong. He went to him and confronted him. Paul didn't write a series of letters. He didn't go into Jerusalem and have a bunch of clandestine meetings. Let's take Peter out. No. He went straight to Peter and confronted what he did. And it was redemptive. How do I know it's redemptive? Because Peter then later writes an epistle, two of them. Thank God for Paul. There's a place for honest confrontation and gracious forgiveness. So why are so many people, now listen, I'm not preaching out yonder. I'm preaching this sermon to believers. Everybody listen to everything I say here. Don't, (laughs) see you sound bite me, you use this against me. That's never happened to me ever. Ask, why why are so many churches acting like the world? Why? Why do we go from disagreement to destruction? I'm not that old, but I can remember when people used to be able to disagree. I don't know if you've noticed, but in the last five to 10 years, you can't do that anymore. If I disagree with you, I gotta take you out. You got to go down. I guess it's because I've got to be the most righteous. I've got to rise up and be the most righteous person in this and rise up. I don't, what, what in the world is going on? And why is this happening in churches? It's a disease. It's, it, it's going on everywhere. I just, want, I just want you to know this. I just want you to know this. I don't primarily see this here. I'm not saying it never happens here. I'm not naive. It's not the primary use here. And here's the way you deal with this. Matthew 18 has a way you deal with people who sow discord. But I just wanna wanna say this going forward for the life of this church, because I won't be here forever. Young people are leaving Christian faith and leaving the church because Christian churches are mean. It's not because they're deconstructing primarily. It's because of what they're watching happen. They're looking and saying, this is like the rest of the world. I just got in the rest of the world and live like the rest of the world. Brothers and sisters, the temptation to act like this has always been here. That's why you have the book of James. That's why you got this context here, Peter. That's why you got Psalm 64. We must not be this way. We must obey the Lord. Because you know what's at stake? Everybody listen to me. You know what's at stake? The gospel. That's what's at stake. Just before you jump on Facebook in the next 18 months, Just remember, those Christian posts you put out there, how you respond to what else is going on in the world should match what you say. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Look at verse 12. His ears are open to our prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? 
But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, for if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. I have a preaching meeting every week. Pastor Casey Shaw at Redemption Hill and I meet every week. We were studying and, and, and talking together and I said, Casey, I've marked this 73114. That means, I know, <laughs> somebody was playing this out with me at that point. That's why I'm praying it. And I looked across the table and I said, Casey, I don't remember who it was. I don't. I don't remember. And I said, I'm telling you that for two reasons, brother. He's a young pastor. You can't harbor what happens. You got to forgive. Number two, you got to trust God. Now, for those of you who are sitting out there, because I, I can hear it, well, he thinks he's righteous. No, I don't. I guarantee you I could go dig up my journal and say, Lord, if I'm wrong here, and this is my time, then this is my time. He's Lord. I'm not. And I just want you to hear this. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil. I don't want to be opposed to God, do you? <laughs> Here's what I want to be, and this is what I want you to be. And I hope you've heard my pastoral concern today. I want us to be a distinct people in a distinct time. This is an angry, seething world that is about to explode at any moment. We need to be the people at work and school and in our neighborhood and on social media that people look at us and say, why are you responding the way you are? Why don't you blow up? Why are you being so gracious to them as bad as they are treating you? So that we can speak to the hope that is in us. In us. It's part of the reason we come together, brothers and sisters. I need to come together like I've heard today to hear you sing the gospel to remind me that the gospel is most important, not me. Amen? Christ is our cornerstone. That's what we're going to sing. Not my relationship with you. You're not my cornerstone. We're not. He is our cornerstone. That's where we rest. So brothers and sisters, let us rest in him. Father, bless your people, help your people. I know there are people here who are being mistreated. I pray, Lord, that they would trust you. I have no firsthand knowledge, but there's likely somebody here who's mistreating someone else. May they repent. And may they recognize today that ultimately, ultimately, they're harming themselves. Lord, cause us now together as your people to humbly rejoice in the Lord and take refuge in him. And if the world does blow up, you got us because you're God. So let now the upright in heart exult. Let us rise together and worship you in Jesus' name.